The Valkyr twins make up the fourth encounter face in Trial of the Crusader. We'll first cover both the 25 man normal and heroic mechanics for this encounter. There are a few different ways to approach this fight, so I'll leave the discussion for strategy and implementation for later. Fuel of Lightbane and Ida's Darkbane are the pair of Valkyr that make up this encounter. They both share the same health pool, much like the Twin Emperors in AQ40. Like their name suggests, Fuel of Lightbane deals light or fire damage, while Ida's Darkbane deals dark or shadow damage. When the encounter begins, four portals spawn around the room. Two light portals and two dark. Clicking on a portal grants the player either a light or dark buff, depending on the type of portal the player interacts with. Interacting with the portal does three things. It grants immunity to the Valkyr of the same type, increases damage done to the Valkyr of the opposite type, and reduces the damage you deal to the Valkyr of the same type. For example, clicking on a light portal grants immunity to all light damage, increases the damage you deal to the dark Valkyr, but reduces the damage you deal to the light Valkyr by 50%. Due to these effects, interacting with the light portal generally means you'll be damaging the dark Valkyr, and vice versa. Interacting with these portals is one of the main mechanics for this fight. How your raid chooses to utilize those portals will vary, and we'll talk about some examples later on. For now, keep this in the back of your mind. Moving on, each Valkyr twin has their own set of type-based abilities. Shield of Light and Shield of Darkness. A shield that protects the sister Valkyr from harm, absorbing 700,000 damage, or 1.2 million damage in Heroic, and prevents spell interruption for 15 seconds. Light and Dark Vortex. This ability has an 8 second cast time into a 5 second channel that does heavy raid wide AoE damage for every second during the channel. It's worth noting that these 4 abilities are cycled through at random, but each will be used at least once before you see a second cast of the same ability, meaning this functions the same as the adds on Freya. Just like how you know Lashes will spawn next if you've only seen a single set of the Conservator and Middle 3 adds. Analogously, if you've seen Dark Shield, Light Shield, and a Dark Vortex, then you know Light Vortex will be the next ability used. Next, Surge of Light and Surge of Darkness. This deals 2500 damage, or 4500 in Heroic, every 2 seconds to players of the opposite type. This is just persistent raid-wide damage over the course of the fight, and gives your healers something to do. Lastly, Touch of Light and Touch of Darkness. This is a Heroic only mechanic that targets a random player and does 9000 damage every 2 seconds for 20 seconds if they're of the opposite type. Meaning if Touch of Light is used on a player with the Light buff, it will do no damage. And that's all for type-based abilities. The Valkyr also have their shared set of abilities in the following. Twins Pact. The Twins Pact heals for 20% of their total health pool, or 50% in Heroic. This ability has a 15 second cast and is interruptible. The cast will begin after Shield of Lights or Shield of Darkness has been cast. But remember, the shield also grants interrupt immunity, meaning the raid needs to burn the shield in order to interrupt the cast, otherwise the boss heals. Next, Power of the Twins. When one twin begins casting Twins Pact, the other twin gains Power of the Twins for 15 seconds. This buff increases the twin's damage by 20% and enables the twin to dual wield. While this buff is active, each successful melee strike gives the twin a stack of Valkyr Quickness, increasing her attack speed by 10%. Tanks save defenses for this ability, and healers watch the tank of the non-casting Valkyr. Lastly, Twin Spike. This ability hits for 125% weapon damage and increases damage taken by 20% for 15 seconds. Tanks can consider using a defensive during this ability, but the twins don't hit tanks very hard to begin with, and it's more important for tanks to save their bigger defensives or power of the twins. And that rounds out the abilities of the Valkyr. The final mechanic that occurs throughout this fight is the summoning of concentrated essences. These spawn on the walls of the room and travel inwards. There are light and dark essences. When a player of the same type absorbs an essence, they gain powering up. Once a player reaches 100 stacks of powering up, they gain a 100% increased damage buff in Empowering Light or Empowered Darkness. If a player of the opposite essence absorbs it, they take AoE damage of that type, affecting them and anyone within 8 yards. In summary, absorb the balls of your type and avoid the balls of the opposite type. More balls spawn in Heroic than in Normal. Now, with the mechanics of the fight out of the way, let's talk strategy. Raid and tank damage this fight are moderately low. The difficulty from this encounter comes from your raid's ability to handle Shield of Lights and Darkness and Light and Dark Vortex. The variation in strategy that we'll talk about primarily revolves around the different ways raids will manage these shields and vortexes. So let's start with what I think is the safest, most standard, normal mode strategy. Variation 1, Split Raid. Have your raid split evenly into two groups, one dark and one light. Have one tank on each Valkyr on opposite sides between a light and dark portal. Have the range and healers of that group spread loosely around their respective Valkyr. You may optionally choose to have one or more healers pick up the opposite attunement type in your group, and we'll discuss why later. 
When the fight begins, interact with the portal of your assigned group and DPS your assigned Valkyr. When orbs spawn, have the range and healers of your group run around and absorb the orbs of their type. If you have one or more healer of the opposite type on your side, they can absorb balls of the opposite color to help mitigate the chance those balls collide with players of the wrong type. When either Valkyr casts Dark or Light Vortex, all players of the opposite type must interact with the portal to swap their type such that they don't take unnecessary AoE damage. For example, if the Light Valkyr casts Light Vortex, the Dark group must interact with the Light Portal, wait for the Light Vortex channel to complete, then interact once more with the Dark Portal. The Light group, on the other hand, does nothing during this cast, since they're already immune. Then, when either Valkyr gains a shield and begins casting Twins Pact, all ranged DPS of the same type must swap and help DPS the shield down to prevent the cast from going off. For example, if Fuel of Lightbane gains Light Shield and begins casting Twin Pact, all light to range DPS must interact with the Dark Portal and help burn the shield down. Once the shield has been broken, those same range DPS swap back to the Dark State and continue to DPS their original add. If your raid is struggling to do enough damage during the shield, have your DPS hold their cooldowns. Send DPS CDs on the first shield, Bloodlust the second shield, then 2-3 to three minute CDs should be back up in time for the third shield. In this strategy, I would advise against having melee swap, given the amount of downtime that would result in having them run all over the arena. Conversely, if your raid does a lot of damage, especially now in the modern version of the game, in normal mode, you likely don't need to have ranged DPS swap and help. For example, let's say you're running a raid setup of 18 DPS, 2 tanks, and 5 healers. If there are 9 DPS on each side, as long as the average DPS per player is above 5.2k DPS, you won't have any issue breaking the shield on normal, and this value is excluding tank and healer damage. So in summary, absorb balls of the correct color, match your type to the Valkyr that's casting Vortex, and range DPS swap sides during Shield of Lights or Darkness to help break the shield if need. Variation 2. Zug Zug turn my brain off, only good for normal mode. For this setup, have the entire raid except for a tank and some healers attuned to one color and only attack one twin. The healers that attune to the opposite color will act as orb soakers. The off tank can either stand away from the raid and hang out on their own, helping with orb soaks, or stack with the rest of the raid for cleave. If, for example, the raid attunes light and attacks dark bane, this trivializes dark shields and light vortexes, and the raid only needs to worry about the other two abilities. To further simplify the encounter, raids with enough DPS can ignore shields on the other twin and allow the 20% heal to go off. This is by far the most simple strategy, but will likely not be viable in heroic due to the heal doing 50% of the boss's health instead of 20%. Variation 3. Split Raid Advanced In this setup, split the raid into halves as discussed in Variation 1, but instead of tanking the Valkyr between two portals, have each tank stand with their group next to a portal of the opposite type. So the tank with Light Bane will stand next to the Light Portal and the tank with Dark Bane next to the Dark Portal. The difference here when compared to Variation 1 is that when a Vortex of the opposite type is being casted, or a shield needs to be broken. Players are right next to the necessary portal such that they can immediately click it to avoid taking vortex damage or to help DPS the other Valkyr. This strategy makes it such that ranged DPS can quickly swap types and maintain DPS uptime when damage is important, as opposed to having to spend time running to a portal when a shield needs to be broken. Once the shield has gone down or the vortex has ended, ranged DPS then run and swap back to their original type. Now we move on to the heroic mode strategies. Variation 4, Center Soaker Strategy. This is the first of two heroic strategies we'll be looking at. As a reminder, in heroic, the shields now absorb 1.2 million health. Twin Pact heals for 50% instead of 20%, and the raid-wide AoE Surge of Light and Surge of Darkness now does 4,500 damage per tick instead of 2,500. And finally, Touch of Light and Touch of Darkness is introduced as a mechanic that deals 9,000 damage every 2 seconds for 20 seconds to a random player. Note that even though changing attunements may nullify the touch of light or touch of darkness, it's likely not worth the DPS loss having the affected player run across the room to interact with multiple portals, in which case, make sure healers stay on top of the affected players. In this method, tank both Valkyr in the center of the room to allow for cleave. Now, how you choose to typhlet your raid will be largely dependent on your own preferences and your raid comp. Things like your melee and range split will contribute to how you do assignments. For now, Let's assume your raid has 10 melee and 8 range DPS. Assign all melee healers 1 tank and 2 range DPS to dark attune, while the remaining 6 range DPS stay light attuned. 
you can alternatively have one or more healers assigned to Light Attune if they're minimally affected by movement, aka Resto Druids. We have more DPS attuned to Dark because the Empowered Darkness buff lasts longer than the Empowered Light buff. It also makes orb soaking easier to manage, in the sense that we have the majority of ranged DPS watching light orbs to prevent tanks, melee, and healers from needing to dodge them, such that only dark orbs move towards the boss. The two dark attuned ranged DPS exist to reduce the number of dark orbs present at any given time, so the other light attuned ranged DPS need to dodge less. Light Shield and Dark Vortex are the easiest counterparts to handle with this setup. The majority of DPS are dark attuned, so burning through the light shield on Light Bane is essentially free. Then because most of the raid is dark attuned, Dark Vortex does no damage. Note the light attuned tank will take full damage from the Vortex, but with their larger health pools it's relatively straightforward to heal. The 6 ranged DPS that are light attuned will need to swap to dark for the Vortex, then swap back for light. Dark Shield and Light Vortex are the more difficult parts of this fight using this strategy. For Dark Shield, all DPS swap to Dark Bane to nuke the shield down without swapping attunement, even with the 50% DPS loss. Note that rogues with Blade Flurry can DPS Light Bane and have their cleave do full damage to Dark Bane even while Dark Attuned. You may want to save CDs or Bloodlust for Dark Shield in order to beat the damage check. Then for Light Vortex, there are two methods of handling this ability. The first way is by having the entire raid swap attunements to Light for the duration of the Vortex, then swap back to Dark upon its completion. The upside to this is that the Light Vortex then does no damage, but the downside is that there is a lot of movement going on during this time and if one too many Dark Orbs hit Raiders while Light Attuned, this can result in a lot of raid damage and may prove difficult to recover from. That said, this is part of the reason we have two ranged DPS Dark Attuned, to reduce the number of Dark Wolves present in the arena at any given time, making it easier to dodge them during a Light Vortex. The second method is not moving and having the entire raid eat a full Light Vortex. Because light damage is considered fire, having a Paladin use Aura Mastery with Fire Resistance Aura and Divine Sacrifice in addition to individual classes using their own personals, it's possible to live through this damage with good defensive CD coordination. Note that while progging this encounter, it's good practice to save your offensive cooldowns for the first shield, Bloodlust for the second shield, and then use cooldowns again for the third shield to ensure your raid is beating the damage check. Rinse and repeat this until the boss dies. Variation 4.5, Modified Center Strap. This strategy is identical to the previously discussed center strat, but instead of tanking Valkyr in the center of the room, they're tanked on the light portal. This way, when Light Vortex is casted, all raiders can quickly swap the light attunement for the duration of the Vortex. Unlike the center strat, where raiders would need to move during the Vortex cast, with this strat, raiders can plant during and move afterwards to change back to the dark attunement. This makes Light Vortex easier to live through at the expense of being closer to a wall, meaning soakers will have less time to predict and soak balls that spawn on the wall nearest to the raid. Variation 5. Door Strategy The final strategy I'll be covering is the door strat, where the entire raid is positioned at the entrance next to the doors. Tank both Valkyr on top of each other for cleave. Have one tank and 2-3 ranged DPS be light attuned, while the rest of the raid stays dark attuned. The light attuned ranged DPS should be positioned in a semicircle around the rest of the raid. It's their job to soak light orbs and prevent them from reaching the rest of the raid while dodging dark orbs. Significantly fewer orbs spawn near the door, which allows for the raid to stack right next to it. Much like the center strategy, Light Shield and Dark Vortex are trivial. Range Soakers just need to swap attunements whenever Dark Vortex is casted. Dark Shield, however, is even more threatening, with nearly the entire raid doing 50% less damage to Ida's Dark Bane. Consider saving offensive cooldowns, Bloodlust, or both for when Dark Shield is used. For Light Vortex, swapping attunements isn't really a viable option, due to being positioned far from the portals and because of the plethora of Dark Orbs flying around the room. Hence, have a Paladin use Aura Mastery with Fire Resistance Aura, pop a Divine Sacrifice, and have the entire raid use defensive cooldowns to live through this channel. With good defensive CD coordination, your raid should be able to live through this ability. Repeat these steps until the Twin Valkyr goes down. And that concludes the discussion of strategy for this encounter. There may be variations and strategies I haven't covered that are viable or even superior to what was discussed, but for that we'll need to wait and learn more once the PGR comes out. Thanks for watching.